Rodney Fox was attacked by a great white shark while competing in the South Australian Spearfishing Championship at Aldinga Beach and was seriously injured around the chest and arm. He is considered a survivor of one of the world's worst non-fatal shark attacks. Rodney was standing on the cliff at Aldinga Beach, 55 kilometers south of their house in Adelaide, South Australia. He had more time now to explore the dark patterns of bottom growth on the reef under the coming blue-green swells. Aldinga Reef is a dream come true for an underwater spear fisherman like him. Forty of them, wearing black rubber suits and flippers, face masks, snorkels, lead-weighted belts, and spear fishing guns, waited for the referee's 9am whistle to signal the start of the annual South Australian Spearfishing Championship Tournament. They had five hours to bring a bag of fish to the judges. The winner would be chosen by the total weight as well as the number of distinct species present. He was confident in his abilities. He had won the championship in 1962 and was returning as the defending champion. He had promised Kay that this was his final competition. He intended to win the title and then retire in triumph, diving just for fun from there on, hopefully with Kay by his side. He was 23 years old and had been training for months. All of the competitors were free divers, meaning they did not use any artificial breathing devices. He practiced diving safely to just over 30 meters and holding his breath for more than a minute without discomfort. They waded into the surf when the whistle blew. Each man hauled a float linked to his lead weight belt behind him. They would instantly attach their fish to these floats after spearing them, hoping that their blood wouldn't attract the constantly hungry and interested predatory sharks that roam the deeper water off South Australia's coast. Fortunately, great white sharks, sometimes known as white death sharks, are rarely seen by skin divers. Nonetheless, a patrol boat crisscrossed their hunting area, keeping an eye out. The day was sunny and hot. The wave tops were smoothed by an offshore breeze, but the water on the reef was disturbed. Because of the previous day's severe winds, visibility beneath the surface would be poor. This makes life difficult for spear fishermen. In murky water, a diver is often too close to a fish once he realizes it's there and scares it away before he can get set for a shot. By 12.30, as Rodney hauled a large catch of parrotfish, snapper, snook, boarfish, and magpie perched to the beach, he could see from the other piles that he was clearly ahead of the competition. On the beach, he had 27 kilograms of fish from 14 different species. It was 12.35 p.m. and the contest ends at 2 p.m. He had ventured a little over a kilometer offshore, hunting bigger and better game as fish gradually became scarcer in the inshore zones. He had seen quite a few enormous fish near a large triangular shaped rock on his previous swim in from the portion of the reef where it drops from about seven meters to 18 meters in depth. Two of the fish were dusky morwongs, sometimes known as strongfish. Either of these would be huge enough to shift the scales in his favor, and one or two more fish of a different species would seal the deal. He swam out to the chosen location, then rested face down, breathing through his snorkel while observing the best approach to the two fish hiding behind the rock through his mask. He took several long breaths, held one, turned over, and dove. He quickly rounded the large rock. The larger dusky morwong, a beauty weighing at least nine kilograms, was browsing in a patch of brown wheat only five meters away. He moved forward, hoping for a close-up. His arms were extended in front of him, one for balance and the other for the gun, which was loaded with a stainless steel shaft and barb. He glided effortlessly over the short weeds and lined up for a perfect head and gill shot. But something massive slammed into him on his left side with incredible power, hurling him into the water. The thing was now propelling him forward at breakneck speed. He immediately felt nauseated. The pressure on his back and chest was intense, and he felt as if his left sides and sides were being squeezed over to his right. He'd lost his face mask and couldn't see in the blur. His spear gun was brutally snatched from his grasp. The pressure on his body appeared to be choking him. 
He tried to shake himself free, but he was gripped as though in a vice. When his head cleared, he knew he was in trouble. A shark had him in its jaws. He couldn't see the beast, but it had to be massive. Its teeth had closed around his chest and back, with his left arm over its head. As they sped through the water, he was propelled face down ahead of it. Despite being disoriented by the shock, he felt no pain. Except for the crushing pressure on his back and chest, there was no sharp sense at all. He reached behind him and groped for the monster's head. The pressure had vanished magically. The creature's jaws had relaxed. He pushed himself back, but his right arm went directly into the shark's mouth. He felt the pain he couldn't have imagined as he ripped his arm free from the shark's jagged teeth. But he had succeeded in releasing himself. He was certain the shark would return for him. A fin brushed against his flippers, and his knees came into contact with its side. He wrapped his legs and arms around the beast, desperately hoping that this would keep him out of its teeth. He scraped the bottom's rocks. He was now severely shaken from side to side. He pushed away with everything he had left. He needed to return to the surface. When he got there, the water was red with his blood. A few meters distant, the shark breached. Its body resembled a massive rolling tree trunk with massive pectoral fins. The enormous conical head was definitely that of a great white. The white death had arrived. As the shark approached, panic coursed through his body. He was alone in the domain of the fearsome beast, and the shark dictated the laws. He was no longer an insurance salesperson in Adelaide. He was nothing more than squirming something to eat. He was terrified that if the shark attacked again, he would die in misery. All he could do was wait. He said a quick prayer for Kay and the baby and prepared to kick at the monster's head. However, the monster abruptly turned away from him, the slanted dorsal fin curling off just above the surface. Then his fish and float began moving rapidly across the water. The slack line tightened around his belt, and he was hauled forward and under the water once more. At the last second, the shark consumed the fish and float instead of him, becoming entangled in the line. He attempted to unbuckle his weight belt, to which the line was tied, but couldn't locate the buckle. His left hand struggled miserably at the release catch as he was hauled quite quickly around 10 meters below the surface. He's not going to drown now, he thought. Then the final miracle happened. The line snapped and he was free once more. When his head reached the surface, all he could scream was, shark, shark. There were voices, familiar noises. And finally, the boat that he had hoped would arrive. He gave up trying to move and instead depended on them to assist him. Hang on, pal, someone kept urging. It's all over. The men in the patrol boat were astounded at the severity of his injuries. His right hand and arm had been cut so terribly that the bones were exposed in many places. Deep gashes ran through his chest, back, left shoulder and side. Large swaths of flesh had been ripped away, revealing his rib cage, lungs and upper stomach. Police officers manning 54 highway intersections got his ambulance through in record time. The Royal Adelaide Hospital surgeons were scrubbed and ready. He recalls seeing the great silver light overhead get dimmer as he approached the surgical table. The next thing he remembers seeing was Kay and his mother standing next to his hospital bed. Kay was crying. The doctor walked over and said, he'll make it now. Rodney Fox had 462 stitches in his chest and 92 inches his right arm. He eventually returned to the sea after a year of intensive therapy. Fox kept skin diving, though not competitively. Despite his fear of sharks, Fox did not want to see them slaughtered. His incident motivated him to learn more about the creatures and to assist others in doing so. During a visit to the Adelaide Zoo in 1964, he had the idea for a protective steel cage that could be lowered into the sea over the side of a boat. Divers could float inside the cage 
allowing them to get near sharks while remaining safe from assault. Fox eventually designed and built the cage. He led the first ever shark cage diving expedition in 1965, and footage from that expedition was featured in the film Attacked by a Killer Shark. Nearly a decade later, he was called by the Jaws producers, who asked for his assistance in recording live underwater video of great white sharks. Fox is now 82 years old and still dives recreationally and professionally. The attack eventually provided him with a glimpse into another realm. He has consulted on over 80 films and has lectured about sharks and his affinity with them all around the world, meeting many lovely people along the way. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please press the like button, consider subscribing to our channel, and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting true story.